afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our uh, Huma book launch series. Um, today we are launching a book published by Cambridge Scholars Publishing. The book is entitled In Shadow We Work, Shadow Polit uh, Politics, Nationalism, and the, uh, and the Oboni Protest Movement by Sanya Oshe. And it's actually an expanded edition from a book that was published in 2007. So I will introduce Sanya Oshe. Sanya Oshe holds a PhD in philosophy and taught the discipline in several Nigerian universities for a decade. He has published extensively on anthropology, cultural knowledge systems of Africa, the politics of the West African region, and the social, political, and cultural rea uh, re realities of Southern Africa. He is also an author of the African Postcolonial Modernity, Informal Subjectivities, and the Democratic Consensus. And uh, he also um, authored post, uh, its new philosophy, among others. He has undertaken extensive research on the discursive status of African systems of knowledge. And he also spent a decade studying and teaching the sociological and political aspects of innovation studies. He held several research positions at the Smith College in the USA, the University of, uh, um, sorry, the, the University of Oregon, Oregon. <laughs> sorry, I, I always mess up that name, and the African Studies Center in the Netherlands. And he also uh, held a position at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the University of South Africa, and the African Institute for South African for South Africa. He is currently a senior research fellow at UMA, and he works on various aspects of the research project on being a human. So, without further ado, I will um, hand the floor the platform to Sanya, and thank you very much for being here. Sonia? Thank you very much, Azar, for that um, detailed introduction. Very grateful for it. And uh, for this also opportunity given by my colleagues at Huma to come and discuss um, a book which I've been working on for several years, um, which has um, taken me to, to, to various um, avenues, experiences, and also um, uh, it's been a, um, what I must call a, a very steep learning curve, a very sharp, uh, intense learning curve. Um, because it, 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 um, it defined most of what my work would be. Um, I must say that um, the the project began shortly after Ken Sarawiwa and the eight eight other Ugoni activists were judiciously uh, sorry um, um, killed under very um, inhumane circumstances by the regime of General Sanya Bacha in 1995, to be precise, November 10. And after that happened, I I was um, very agree because Ken Sarewiwa had become quite an international figure before his life was taken by the regime. He had been very active in drawing global attention to the plight of the indigenous Ogoni people in the Niger, Niger Delta area of Nigeria, which had been experiencing a lot of um, unrest due to the um, current or due to the then um, um, deplorable activities of the oil prospecting companies that were extracting oil and gas from the region. The um, streams, the rivers, and the farmlands in Ogoni land and the surrounding areas where oil was being extracted, had been polluted, livelihoods were being destroyed, people were not able to go to their farmlands, people were not able to fish because fish was dying in the water, 
the atmosphere itself had become quite polluted and quite um, um, unconducive for any kind of existence, any kind of, you know, for living organisms generally. So that was the situation that um, Ken Saruiwa drew the attention of the world to. And um, when he was when he was killed, because he was also a very um, energetic, charismatic personality, um, I wanted to find out what had really happened in um, Ogoni territory. So when he died, I I immediately applied for a research grant from the French Institute for Tropical. Um, research in Africa, it was called IFRA, which was based in the University of Ibadan, where I was based then. And um, I undertook field work for several days there, I lived there. Lived. Fortunately, I had some research contacts who, and guides who took me around because it was very, very unsafe then. The Ogonitori territory and, you know, as a whole was thoroughly militarized. There were, there were soldiers and there were all kinds of spies, government spies who didn't want people to know what was happening, didn't want people to write about it. And I managed to get there, live there through some very, very um, important people, contacts to me that I met and I lived amongst them. And each day when I was there, I would undertake field trips. I would go and interview um, Ogoni indigents who had first knowledge of the political situation because it was a very tense political situation. There was a lot of acrimony and division amongst the Ogonis themselves with some of them who had, in, in other words, sold out the struggle to government, government there and also those who were opposed to who, who took the pro Sarawiwa stance and you know outlook regarding the conflict. So I it was a very difficult situation trying to get interviews, especially from what you, the pro-government um, actors, forces, and actors, and um, also even the um, pro Sarawiwa actors, activists, where some of them, a lot of them were quite apprehensive about talking to me because, and I, like I said, the, the, the place was highly mil militarized and there were government spies and what have you um, there. So no one wanted to risk their lives because a lot of people had been arrested, brutalized and tortured. And also, so, and a lot of the victims of the government um, sponsored violence had started to leave the country. A lot of them had been going to neighboring countries of, of Benin Republic and then en route to the US. And many of them were relocated to the US during the crisis. And, and shortly after, Karat Sarawua was murdered. So I spent some time, like I said, interviewing, gathering notes, and what have you. And when I completed that, that task, I went back to my base and had to write a report. I wrote the report, um, say, just about six months. It took me so to, so it was a very intensive period of work um, because I had to deliver my report in about six months. I did that and unfortunately, the French Research Institute that sponsored the research were not able to publish it because of the political situation. And they didn't want to touch anything that would offend the government. So the report um, gathered dust in the, in the, uh, for, for several, several years, several years, perhaps even 10 years. Um, and I just, it, it was a, a very, almost traumatizing experience for me because um, I put in all this work and risked my life. And at the end of the day, no one wanted to publish the report. 
a report that they had sponsored and you know funded and um and like i said i forgot about it even though it was tugging at my mind and then I got this research fellowship in, the, in, the, in South Africa at the University of uh, KwaZulu-Natal and um, f they were interested in issues of civil society in on this, uh, uh, social movements, protest movement. Fortunately, I'd done something like that. So I raised it with them and said, I have this report that has been gathering dust for several years and I was wondering whether they would be interested in putting it out and the original report was about 150 pages. And they said, oh, no, they couldn't publish the report in totality. What they would do is that they would um, publish an abridged, abridged version, if I was willing to submit one. Um, I thought about it, and I thought perhaps this was a, um, a useful option to explore. So I started to work on it in a bridge fashion because um, it was written in a, uh, like a, a report style, a reportorial style, not, um, it, it needed some kind of, a lot of work actually to get into a shirt for academic purposes. So I worked on it for some weeks and so, and then published an abridged um, version of the original report, which came up to like say 50 pages. And then after that, I um, sought the involvement of a publisher in the UK who agreed to publish the entire book. That was a year later. Um, this version that has just been, it's been launched today was um, something that started see in 2015 after that, that was to mark 20 years of the of the of the anniversary of Ken Weaver's death to mark 20 years there was um, a series of events around the world to uh, mark the occasion um, that's 20 years after so I, and I was invited by the Lagos Book and Arts Fest Festival to, to be one of the discussions on, 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 the, on the occasion of the 20th anniversary of Kensa Uwa's de death. And that um, opportunity snowballed into other uh, series of paper, papers, and you know, which I wrote some of which, uh, one of which I presented in my, in my earlier seminar, this parts of which I presented in my earlier seminar. Um, during the attire of, um, seminar series. And um, so I developed those papers and then expanded the book because I, I think the, the book was due for revision and expansion given the events that had occurred um, after the passing of Ken Sarawiwa. So that, that is the book we're launching today, which is like an ongoing that, that started, you know, years ago when Sarah was, you know, was murdered. But I never thought I'd be still be on that journey. It's a continuing journey that um, has been a tragic um, event it's for, for many people and it's something that we try must always remind ourselves of, uh, about um, someone who fought gallantly for a cause, who stood who stood up to power, who stood up to the brutality of the military regime when many many people were too scared to do that, and he paid the ultimate price. And I think um, we should always take the opportunity to celebrate what he accomplished, what he fought for, because what he fought for, the causes with which he fought for, are still very relevant and still very pertinent to our world, in a world where we're trying to develop very humane communities and societies and humane values, civic values. Those were the sort of values he died fighting for. And we should always remind ourselves of our heroes who passed away, passed on gallantly um, in fighting for these values and 
and um, beliefs. I'll stop here for now and uh, take responses and elaborate and elaborate what on what needs to be elaborated. And I want to thank you all for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Tanya, for um, the very interesting uh, presentation about the book. And I am going to now act up, also as a discussant of the book. And I read it from you know cover to cover. And I'm really like, it, for me, it's actually um, it's interesting because it also spoke to me about the current situation in Sudan. I found it very fascinating how um, uh, the how the issues are uh, unfolding in Nigeria and, and how the issues are unfolding in Sudan are pretty similar. And um, so I I would like to ask start with the question of um, um, I mean you wrote this expanded edition. So what exactly did you expand in this edition? I know you had like those a very fascinating after forward for the book. And I think this is where it lays the, the expansion. Um, so how do you connect this memorial moment of King Sarawiwa, celebration of King Sarawiwa with what's currently happening in the political, um, especially the executive world, like you, know, you, you talked about Boko Haram. So what is the connection between this kind of fascinating um, memorial moment of King Sarawiwa and the current Nigerian political landscape. Thank you very much for that interesting and complex question. Um, like I said, um, what the values and uh, beliefs Ken Sariwa died for are still very pertinent. What are we talking about? We're talking about issues of democracy, individual freedom, cultural autonomy, we're talking about also um, um, environmental um, sa um, sanity, ecological, um, um, ecological, you know, um, rationality. You know, being rational, being you know, because in, in the, now we're talking about global warming and all kinds of uh, impending environmental disasters facing us and. Um, those were the sort of issues Sarua raised. And what he, like I said, he went beyond those immediate concerns to the question of democracy because he was also uh, uh, fighting for, um, against dictatorship, military dictatorship. And after he died, um, fortunately, um, Nigeria was able to transition back into democracy, which was which occurred, say, roughly four years after he passed. There was a return to democracy. You mentioned Boko Haram, and um, that is a totally different kind of problem and crisis because. Um, this, this, first of all, Ken Sarawiwa wasn't a violent person. He didn't uh, advocate for violence, a uh, violent overthrow of the, of, the, of the administration, the political establishment. He didn't advocate for that. But in the case of Boko Haram, and the, you know, there's a contestation for um, the kind of political dissertation Nigeria should be. I mean, they, now they're talking. They, there's a lot of violence going on. There's a lot of instability, and there's a lot of. Um, um, it's a different kind of picture, a different scenario, totally. Like because um, the, not only the government is being challenged, the nation as a whole is being challenged by the onslaught of Boko Haram, and their values are a bit different. They're not pro democracy. They're not pro human rights as we know it, you know, and because they, it's, it's a totally different way of looking at the world and they want to impose that on the rest of the nation. And beyond that also, because they have 
transnational um, um, connections and a transnational because it, it's a it's a pan Islamic um, agenda. So which is totally different. And so we're confronted by something totally different, something that the, the discourse and language that um, Sarua pursued um, totally, is totally contrary to what is occurring now. So there's a difference of that, there's a difference at several levels. Um, I think um, Sarua would have been quite aggrieved by what is currently happening because he was a man of peace. Um, I remember um, um, somebody mentioned something about the um, figure of a man of peace during this crisis, that what can we do to promote that vision of a man of peace during times of crisis like this? Um, I think it was Dominic, yes, I think yes, Dominic did. And that in the time of crisis, how beneficial and how important is it to explore the notion of the man of peace, the figure of a man of peace. And on, on second thoughts and deeper reflection, Ken Sariwa was that sort of man. Was that because he he was a man of peace in many respects and he like he would have frowned upon the ceaseless killing of innocent people just because you are opposed to whatever political dispensation is happening. I hope I've been able to respond to your question. Thank you very much. Um, so I mean, it's interesting how um, also like it's somehow like a backfire on, on the Nigerian state. I mean, when it's the time of democracy, then you have all those kind of paramilitary groups that are rising. And when it was a dictatorship, you have some kind of a these kind of peace, peace, peaceful movement that are um, like the, uh, the, the king of democracy, which, which is the irony of having this kind of two different um, situations. Um, which brings me to the, uh, my other question is, um, I also what I liked when I was reading the book, I liked how you link the history of the, the, the colonial history in the, in the Nigeria Delta, like the colonial history of uh, capitalism of exploitation. And I think it's pretty nicely done. And what I was, what I want to more provoke in this discussion is about, um, I mean, you mentioned that the, also you talked about militarism and the Nigerian state and how it's militarized. You know? And for me, it's, I would have also liked to see um, how, uh, what is the colonial kind of um, colonial um, legacy in the military in the in the militarization of the Nigerian state? Because for me, colonialism is also a military project, and, colon and the colonial administrative systems we have now we, we inherited are like these are military administrative systems. So I would like to see how would you how could you reflect on that? Because I mean. Just looking at the case of Sudan, I mean, I could trace the military institution in Sudan back uh, to the British uh, colonialism when they started to recruit Sudanese soldiers. So please um, elaborate more on that. I mean, it's implicitly in the book, but I would like to bring it more. Thank you so much for, for that very important intervention. Yes, that's true. Um, I think there's a link between the economy of violence uh, in a colonial setup and what occurs uh, in post-colonial um, in a post-colonial context um, a lot of um, theorists and researchers have worked on this sort of issue Ashili Mbembe for instance calls it the the commandement in which um, what he says is that uh, the economy of violence in a colonial regime continues after um, colonialism. That it's it's, it's the post-colonial elite, you know, um, adopted. They hardly it's unreconstructed. It's not transformed. They just you know adopted you know and wholesale and 
not a shilling BNB has worked in that sort of issue. Um, historians like Tony Falola have worked in that as well. And um, also the late, the recently deceased who died last year, the uh, Congolese historians, N.S. Wamba Dia Wamba, he, he said that, he argues that Mobu, when Mobutuism doesn't end with Mobutu, it continues after Mobutu. So we have elements of the kinds of state violence perpetrated under the regime of Mobutu. Just because Mobutu is gone doesn't mean that it ends, it continues. So, that's, so, so it's all part of what you mentioned about the inheritance of violence, the apparatus of violence by post-colonial regimes from colonialism, um, it, it extends. And mind you, uh, uh, interestingly, actually, uh, it, it, we, we can even re relate it to the uh, last SAS um, protest that gripped many parts of Nigeria in October, uh, uh, starting from September, where for several days and weeks, um, there were demonstrations against um, police br brutality and what have you. And, um, uh, researchers have argued that you know it's still part of the colonial dispensation that the post-colonial state uh, 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 inherited, that the apparatus of of, of uh, violence wasn't reconstructed; it continued. Yeah, so um, yeah, I agree with you totally about that. Uh, that the continuation of of the regime of violence that can, that links the, the colonial regime to the post-colonial dispensation that is always there and it occurs anywhere you find colonialism because people um, the political establishment that inherited the state did very little to reconstruct the organs and institutions so the institutions were still um, pervaded by the same logic and mindset that they visited on, on the so-called natives. And then when people become citizens, that violence in many cases continues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I have like just a, a, a last kind of provoking um, would well, how would you respond to if someone said, yeah, federal, the federal state in Nigeria failed to manage ethnic diversity? So what would be your response for that kind of um, kind of question that is discussed? That like, since it, the, if it's like the question of um, how do you respond to the statement of Nigeria Nigeria federalism failed to manage diversity, ethnic diversity, religion diversity. And what would be your response? Because it's also extensively discussed in the book. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a, obviously the Nigerian state hasn't managed diversity quite well, but uh, Nigeria is a awfully, awfully diverse country. <laughs> it's incredible. The only countries that I know that are as diverse as Nigeria, for instance, uh, maybe the DRC or Cameroon, which is quite diverse as well, you know, Nigeria, for instance, until recently, um, they were saying, linguists were saying that there were about over 500 languages. They, Every kind of linguistic family tree found in Africa can be tree, can be found in Nigeria. You know, any kind of thing, and, you know, the fact there will be variants of any kind of uh, cl um, linguistic cluster you found in in Africa. In, in Africa is the most diverse in terms of um, language and what have you. So I mean, like I said, so perhaps over five hundred languages. Um, Cameroon is equally diverse, so it's um, um, the DLC extremely diverse, and um, the colonialists didn't who created this um, countries didn't take that into account at all. I think you know, and um, the regimes or the governments that um, took over from them, the 
African governments that took over from them had no idea too, I mean, for most parts too, on how to manage, manage diversity. Nigeria tried by you know, um, instituting the federal arrangement, but it hasn't worked for them. Well, arguably, I would argue, but I mean, um, somehow they managed to keep the country together in spite of the fact that there, there had been a civil war. There was a civil war from 1967 to 1970. And there have been constant agitations because you have various kinds of outlooks. You have different um, religions for, you know, um, religious outlooks that are contesting for ascendancy, for hegemony, and, and then often in quite... Um, assertive, sometimes violent ways. And you know, so, um, so uh, it's, it's debatable to the extent of which one could argue that federalism has worked or what we, uh, it's, a, it's a form of Nigerian federalism that has, you know, we, we've tinkered with and um, played around with, toyed with to keep the country one or to keep it uh, unified and, you know, and, um, <sighs> The extent of the success or otherwise of, of, of that um, uh, strategy is debatable. You know, um, we have out constant outbreaks of um, like violence, and that, you know, but there have also been, like I, I would say, that um, important instruments for conflict re resolution that have been developed or and, and explored to manage this issue of diversity, because uh, yeah. Nigeria is incredibly diverse, like I said, over 200, almost 300 ethnicities to start with, almost 300. And then you have, like I said, perhaps about 500 languages. I think. So, so, so that's uh, quite a problem, managing that kind of quality for any, you know, in spite of whatever instruments we're able to develop, in spite of whatever um mechanisms and institutions are put in place it will always be problematic yeah i mean as we said in sudan like every two neighbors speak their own language now <laughs> because we also have that kind of sort of uh, yeah ethnic and linguistic diversity um thank you very much uh for the like, very elaborate responses i now um give the floor for um questions and uh, please, everyone who wants to ask a question, either write the blue hand, yeah, or the yellow, the yellow hand now, okay. Um, so we have Divine. Uh, uh, thank you, Aza, and uh, thank you, Sanya, for uh, the opportunity of, uh, of reading the book and also, of also just listening to your reflections on uh, on, on, on cancer or you are. So I, I'm, I'm going to ask uh, two questions. I mean, one uh, is more a provocation to push you more uh, to talk about uh, perhaps the uh, a conceptual or, or theoretical significance of cancer or you are just beyond uh, uh, this, this, this discourse of him as an activist. And uh, I, I've, I've posed the question that what, what should we do with cancer we were today, or how should we use, or how should we deploy uh, a cancer we were? And I, I'm pushing you more uh, to think uh, about it, or to think through it conceptually or, or, or theoretically. And then the second uh, question, given your response to Azar, um, is more on um, this uh, reflection on the nation state, which of course has been pushed and explored, you know, to its limit. Uh, but which we, we keep returning to it. Uh, over the past years, we have seen um, uh, secessionist movements, for example, arise in Cameroon. We saw in Ghana that there was a, a movement asking for secession in Opel Velta. We see in Ethiopia now, uh, after Eritrea, now there's a new push in Ethiopia. We've seen in Sudan. You know, we're seeing all across the continent that um, this a part of this dream which uh, these founding patriarchs had, you know, to build this, this nation state, this Pan-African state is beginning to dissipate. So um, I'm, I'm pushing you to look, take Kinsella we on that and, and that experience and the knowledge and the research that you've done. How should we relate 
to this notion of this ethno-nationalist nation state today. Thank you so much for that very challenging and interesting um, intervention, Devan. I really appreciate it. Yes, um, I, I, I think the I think the theoretical usefulness of of Kansarua's work are, are, are multiple. They're quite multiple. Um, um, for us at Humor, for instance, when we are talking about what it means to be human. I think Kentaro has typified that because he he fought for the dignity of, of, of his people, he and beyond um, in the Niger Delta, he fought for the dignity of the earth uh, and uh, inhabitant as a whole. He fought for that because he he knew that the lifestyle, the kind of lifestyles and economic um, systems were pursuing were injurious to the health of the earth. Um, so from the point of view of um, sheer environmentalism, you know, and there's so much theoretical possibilities to be explored there. I mean, we have the issue of global warming. We have the issue of the depletion of um, the natural resources of the earth. Uh, of the earth at an alarming rate. Um, we have the, uh, you know, the question of the, um, you know, fossil fuels being, uh, you know, uh, we're looking for alternatives now people, to fossil fuels so that we, you know, um, we can preserve and prolong the, uh, the, uh, the health of our inhabitant, uh, that's, I'm um, sorry, hab sorry, of our habitat rather, of our habitat. And, and his work chimes with that kind of activism and kind of um, insights. Um, so there are several levels of that, which we could, um, that's just from, if you look at it from the environmental perspective, there was a lot, a lot of interesting theoretical possibilities to be explored there. Then um, I mentioned the question of being human, being, uh, you know, the dignity of the human, which he fought for gallantly in spite of the obvious dangers to his uh, well-being and the well-being of his fellow activists, and he paid the up, uh, ultimate price. Um, he was, he was also, there was a, there's a lot of tension and complexities in, in his activism because, because he wasn't a sex, you wouldn't call him as, I think, uh, a secessionist. He didn't want to succeed uh, for the Nigerian Federation. He wanted, um, better representation, he wanted better standards of living and he for, agitated for that. And he agitated for democracy, he wanted that. He wanted um, fairness and equity among citizens, um, and, you know, and he wanted responsible institutions to manage the quality. And he stood for all the sort of things. So even the question of being human, I think is very important to He's a very important figure, or yes, um, um, to explore and you know, so um, to and 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 employ in in, in in trying to establish what we mean by human and the possibilities inherent in the in, in the notion. So he's very important in that sense. Now we mentioned about the disturbing cases of of. Um, uh, separatist agendas, ethnic part particularisms all over Africa that are springing up that, you know, um, and then how the, this might affect the idea of the nation state. I think the, perhaps we start to think about how, for instance, how useful is that entity, that contraption, the nation state in, in you know, because I, for, for purposes in Africa, have they? Have, can we really say they've been quite successful in um, in managing, uh, representing our diversities? I think it's questionable. I mean, like I said, we, I mentioned earlier how diverse Africa is it's linguistically, ethnic, eth, uh, ethnically, and then even you know, religious in, in the religious perspectives. And but the nation states, what has what it's had to do is is to 
in several places, even like Tanzania during um, in, in Tanzania during Nyeri Lewis time is to try and homogenize this diversities to, to make them uniform. And it's to strip them of their diversity and um, that's to achieve the goal of um, constructing some sort of pan-national identity, national identity, how successful that has been, debatable. And um, perhaps we should start to think of other instruments, other institutions that would manage our diversities and under instruments, perhaps we should start to question the, the sanctity of, of, of the nation state as a contraption, as a as a formation for representing us in terms of diversity, in terms of, and we have the, you know, quite diverse. So maybe we should start to think deeper about um, the sort of institutions we can involve and develop who represent us, you know, and and my, I think the institution that we would have to develop would be very, would have to be very conversant with our historical realities and uh, contextual um, uh, um, contextual character, which is quite like unique anywhere in the world, because like I said, we're incredibly, incredibly diverse society and this continent. And like, like I said, maybe the institutions we obviously the institutions we inherited from colonialism hasn't represented this or captured this diversity well. They've been quite arbitrarily, arbitrarily. And they've been quite, um, they've been found to be quite wanting in representing, yeah, the diverse nature of our continent. But I think I thank you for that question. I think yes, it does need a lot of reflection. It does need a lot of work to develop the um, theories and tools to address the issue. I agree with you totally. That we need more challenge, need to ask more challenging questions, and we need to develop more um, encompassing um, theoretical possible um, theoretical um, tools and conceptual approaches to capture our realities, our existential realities as Africans. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya, for your response. Um, Divine, do you have? I'm uh, sorry, I can't see the like. I think because of the spot lighting, I can't see anyone else. <laughs> but um, yes, um, so um, I see there's a lot going on in the chat, and if anyone wants to bring it, um, yeah. And I see Mimi has some kind of responses. So um, would you like to um, unmute your your microphone and probably bring the discussion to, yeah. So this, it's an interesting discussion going in the chat and I will be very, okay, there's, okay. So should we start with Mimi or? We, because there's Ibrahima who's raising his hand. Hello. I don't <laughs> mind starting. Okay, yeah. Okay, then you, you start Mimi and then we will continue with Ibrahima. Okay. First of all, thank you so much, Sanya, for presenting your book. I I think it's very it's a very, very important um, um, piece of writing to think about. Um, the figure of kin and all the other kins that are existing across the continent. I was mentioning in the chat that um, there are numerous ac activists that have uh, existed, you know, in the past and in the present um, during our post-colonial period. And I, I mentioned that um, Activism is 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 very difficult in in our in our current context, especially because we are fighting against uh, institutions that were previously um, 
installed as a way of perpetuating uh, 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 colonial success. So think of anything, any type of institution, whether it's economic, you see it in multinational companies, in the oil companies, whether it's, it's, it's in mining uh, or any other colonial activity. These institutions uh, were, were designed especially um, to, to, to absorb much of the wealth of Africa at, at our expense and for the profit of, of wealthier countries. And which perpetuate, you know, a ripple effect across, you know, our social uh, fabric and things like that. So, and and I think it's it's although activism is good, and it it represents or it gives us a, a glimpse of what hu being human should be. It's difficult to to undo those institutions when those institutions are still perpetuating and those in power or who are previously. Uh, um, managing the colonial project are still using the same frameworks right now in our post-colonial or neo-colonial period, so to speak. So that's that's where my mind is at this point. And I think that um, being human or imagining being human at this point in time for an African citizen or an, or an African local might be difficult because of, as you mentioned, there are more than 300 ethnic groups in Nigeria. That's just Nigeria only. I don't know how many, how many we can count across the continent. What does being human mean as a collective of, 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 of Africa? I think that might be something challenging to conceptualize uh, because of our differences. And um, I think those, those, those differences are also part of the challenge of what our current uh, uh, local governance structures are facing when trying to to achieve what they want to call good governance when they're now you know they they they're conflicted with you know the the recent they've just exited a colonial past and they're trying to reimagine a, a present and there's just this you know I don't know how to to put to to, to explain myself there's just this difficulty in imagining just a good structure for our continent. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm struggling to find the right words, but um, I hope I'll be able to, to think about it a bit more and maybe have a conversation later about this, because I, I think it's interesting. Hello, is anyone there? Mm. Uh, yes, Tanya, do you have any response to Mimi's comment? Um, uh, it's a very insightful comment. I mean, it, um, yes, she, she, she uh, reiterated the, the, the realities we face as Africans that we inherited uh, institutions that um, um, that only in, in our words for that the sucks their colonial success and a lot of our political elites have not thought through what that success would mean in a post-colonial setting mm -hmm. they, I think they were much more interested in, in 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 the perks of power and maintaining the status quo so for instance if it's if it's um if such institutions of colonialism didn't favor the majority, but it favors a certain political class or a certain political segment of society, you, they were maintained and by the political elite because they benefited them and you know they were able to um, uh, entrench themselves to the detriment of the wider society. That that occurred, um, you know. Yes, I agree with Mimi totally about that, and um, I, I I and I also sympathize totally, totally with her frustrations about the um, failures or drawbacks of these institutions in representing our capturing and representing our diversities that. Um, 
um, and that um, and given our diversities, we need to ask tougher and hard, more difficult questions regarding what human means, definitely. And, and I'm sure that um, our languages, our cultures, our religions, our spiritualities have um, or have impressive, impressive tools mm -hmm. for representing that, for trying to represent that. I, I appreciate the, the gravity and uh, gravity of the question. I appreciate the gravity of the um, challenge before us to uh, evolve and establish institutions that represent us, uh, that capture our uh, yeah, diversities. I appreciate that totally. And I know how frustrating that can be as well. Thank you very much, Tanya. I see Ibrahima raising his hand. So I invite you, Ibrahima, to unmute yourself. And OK, so thank you. Thank you, Sanya, for your presentation. I think it's a very interesting book who enable us to have an interesting debate. Uh, and I agree with you when you were talking about the statism of violence. I think uh, this phenomena uh, close uh, all around uh, the, the African continent. If you are analyzing the way that the, uh, the, the, the Senegalese police, they are uh, interacting with people here is the same things, you know. I, I used to say that we need to 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 to, to change the the software of our of, of our police um, because they, they they used to 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 to, to function with the, the 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 same the same uh software like the, the, the colonial uh, uh authorities. So I have some some questions. And the first one, it what what it remains on on Ken Sarawi uh, legacy uh, for for Goni people against uh, uh, multinational like like Cell. The second is who are the the, the, the modern figure of uh, Nigerian contestation or Nigerian social movement. I would like to know and 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 also. I would like to know with, who are the, 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 the scholars who are uh, like maintaining the, uh, the, 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 the resistance, who are mobilizing the, uh, the, 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 the population uh, for, 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 for some uh, uh, fights uh, concerning the, uh, the environment, concerning the, 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 the resource, how, how, how we have to go to to, 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 to retribute all the, the population to have equity in, 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 in resource. So <clears throat> the, the last one is to ask you whether there is a link between the, the failure of elites in Nigeria and the rising of Boko Haram. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for Ibrahim and for those questions were quite, um, Interesting, quite challenging, and very pertinent. Thank you so much for that, um, for the thought. Uh, now, you mentioned the issue of um, Ken Sarua's legacy. I think his legacy is quite diffuse now, and not, not, not in a negative sense, but I mean, it's quite um, pervasive. Um, um, it's, 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 um, he left behind a huge challenge for subsequent um, activists fighting this for similar causes such as he did because he paid the ultimate price. No, you know, we want to fight, we want, but we want to fight, live to fight another day. We don't want to lose our lives in the fights so we, we engage in. Uh, we need to, you know. So, I mean, so it, it's a kind of legacy that is very difficult to pursue in the way he did it. You know, he was a, a, an extraordinary person and he achieved extraordinary things in spite of um, the way he, his life ended. Um, his legacy, there have been two kinds, both negative and positive aspects of his legacy. Um, there hasn't been another kind of charismatic person that has risen 
promoting the set of courses he did, um, um, the courses of environmental rights, what we democracy, dignity, cultural autonomy, um, and those sort of related issues, um, both within the Niger Delta and beyond, because Ken Saruma actually in many cases was looking beyond the Niger Delta. He wanted his environmentalism to, um, to spread all over Africa and he developed a continental uh, institution or organization rather, organization to um, promote the courses they believed in. Um, um, so when you ask, well, how, who have been the people who have come over uh, after him? There's been a lot of um, uh, devaluation of his, of, his, of his kind of ethics, um, I would say, because um, a lot of um, criminal elements, for instance, have adopted or I tried to hijack his, uh, um, his uh, vision and use it for their own self-serving purposes. Um, so there's been a lot of false militancy, militancy that appears as militancy, but it's actually banditry that occurred after he passed on. Um, but there are also some very, very effective um, activists like Nimo Basi and quite a number of them who have been working quietly behind the scenes. They are not as um, perhaps as uh, prominent as he was because they are much more they're different in their approaches and different in their personalities and also outlooks and then difference in the political dispensations. I mean, we're not longer under a military regime. It's a, it's a civilian dispensation. So their, um, their approaches have differed uh, from the sort of approaches Saruwa pursued. Um, so that in, in that sense, his legacy is continuing. You do have a, no, a number of um, silent, quiet, effective activists working um, to ensure that his vision and his goals are accomplished. Um, you do have that, but I, like I said, you, you know, there, there's been also criminal elements, both by um, those working in government and those outside government, because there was a criminalization, criminalization of his ethos um, after he died, so that he, to make sure that um, someone like him doesn't um, emerge again and cause um, um, such um, disruptions to the political status quo. That and economic status quo as well. So that that so like I said, that there's been both um, positive and negative attitude. Um, now you also mentioned something in relation to Boko Haram. Sorry, what, how do you link? I want to see what what were you trying to link with uh, with um, the Kenya so the, the question is: Is there a link between the failure of elite and the rising of Boko Haram? Um, um, the links, the links are quite, um, I think, quite oblique in a way because I, I, the it is the failure of the political parts of the failure of the pol political elite that gave rise to Boko Haram. Because I mean, a lot of people are disenfranchised. They come from the so-called Al Majeris, the young boys who are, you know. Um, on the streets, perhaps with very little social um, networks or no more social networks and catch it. And then they are, they are used by, um, as con they are used as cannon fodder by um, over ambitious um, demagogues and, and, and religious fanatics who you know, have a, a much broader or a sinister agenda, um, political agenda, and they're able to use, capitalize on the disaffection and the, the positionality of the disenfranchised in society and to adopt them to and, and to weaponize them for um, courses and agendas that are not for, for, um, pro Nigerian or, you know, for this, you know. So, in that case, I mean, I feel, uh, there's a link between the failure of the political elite and the rise of Boko Haram because the, you know, the, the, there's a fa clear failure of leadership. As a, uh, there's been a, an abdication of responsibility 
in which such elements are allowed, uh, have been able to thrive and emerge, uh, emerge and thrive uh, rather. And yes, so to that extent, one could um, identify a certain link with um, the political elite and the rise of Boko Haram. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sanya and Ibrahima. Um, I want to, like, I mean, we have like a couple of minutes before the session ends. So if there is anyone who has a question or a remark or a comment, um, just show your hand. Okay. Okay, so apparently there's uh, people are satisfied. <laughs> um, uh, so um, I, don't, I will um, end the session here. I mean, I think we are now actually we are now given like nine minutes past five. So um, yeah, uh, you have any final words, Sonia? To I want to thank you specifically for sharing the event. I want to thank everybody, Divine, and those who are present and those who ask questions, very challenging questions. I thank you for your questions. And yes, I, I was hoping I would just coast through, but I mean, I've had to think, you know, harder. And I have to take a, a lot of the questions I know I might not have answered properly, but I, I assure you, I think very deeply about them and I'd work on them and try and incorporate them in future work regarding the, the sort of book. I thank you sincerely for your interventions and your presence and your, yes, and your insights, which I value very much. Thank you so much. Oh, um, yeah, I think we are now getting to the end of the session and thank you very much, Sanya, and for everyone. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we will have the next uh, session. When will it? When is it, Amina? <laughs> next week. I believe next Monday. It's April nineteenth, and the we're having the uh, the lunch of the of the two institutes together. Um, yes. Yeah, so we we'll be back here on the nineteenth. Uh, yeah. So. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you. Yeah, I think we stopped the recording. Fine.